Okay, today is Monday, April 22nd, 2013. And we are scheduled to discuss learning module 7 about confidentiality. But before we do that, I need to wrap up investigative interviewing regarding child maltreatment, which was really way back in learning module 5, but if you recall, I mentioned this at the beginning of the last class, I'll mention it again, I flip-flopped them, at least from a lecture perspective, and I lectured on learning module 6 first, which was investigations, and last week I talked about investigative interviews, and we're going to wrap up my lecture from last week about investigative interviews. And the way that we did that was we talked about kids and interviews and how they remember stuff and what they remember best and what they have difficulty remembering. And we talked about different kinds of memory, memory so I'm going to review that right now. As I started out by saying last week, once the defense bar began to realize that the interviewers sometimes made mistakes and didn't use best practice in the 1980s. They began to focus not on the child during cross-examination, but on the interviewer. And we talked about how the attack now began to be an attack on the interviewer rather than the child. And that allowed uh, lawyers who were adverse to the child's allegations uh, to feel a little bit better challenging the prosecutor's case or challenging the deputy attorney general's case or the plaintiff's attorney's case. They didn't have to beat up on the child, so to speak. They could rather beat up on the interviewer. And the interviewers uh, gave them plenty of fodder for cross-examination, especially in the 1980s when there were a number of cases throughout the United States that wound up being reversed by the Supreme Courts of the states in which they occurred because of an inept or poor interview practice. And we began to talk about one such case, perhaps the leading case in America, the state of New Jersey versus Margaret Kelly Michaels, although there were others, the McMartin case, which you read as part of your discussion forum, the Little Rascals Daycare Center case in North Carolina, the Fell Acres case. Uh, nearly every state had some such case that was problematic because of the manner in which children were interviewed. We've moved beyond that, thankfully, over the past 20 years, and we learned a lot from those cases. I mean, Margaret Kelly Michaels is a blemish on law enforcement and child protection because it uh, is a reminder of how poor the interview practice was back in the 1980s and how much potential there was to um, affect justice and whether justice was found in those prosecutions or not. Before I reflect back on Margaret Kelly Michaels, I just want to tell you um, in review a little bit about what we discussed last week. We talked about children's memory capacity, and I made the observation that kids, children know more than they can tell, especially when they're preschoolers and five or six years old. Uh, the memories are there. The information uh, is processed and becomes part of their recollections the challenge is tapping into those recollections with preschoolers and younger children and facilitating their ability to express themselves so children know more than they can tell, and we talked about that at some length last week. Um, we talked about the different kinds of memory. There's free recall, and what was the other kind of memory? Recognition memory. The way I always remember no pun intended, the way I always remember the difference between free recall and recognition memory, and to give you the definitions, free recall is that amount of memory that one can produce without the aid of prompts or cues or help, if you will. It's just a tell me what you remember, tell me what happened, tell me about your drive to class, tell me about your time in 
the Caribbean. You know, it's an open-ended request for information, and free recall is an open-ended way to deliver that information. Recognition memory, on the other hand, is that kind of memory that arises from prompts or cues or something that's out there that jogs our memory, that helps us remember stuff. Recognition memory. And the way that I differentiate between the two, in my mind, is I focus on recognition memory in the word recognize, which is the root of recognition memory. So when I hear recognition memory, I know that's the kind of memory where when you recognize something, it helps you remember. I talked about the Montclair State Rape case, that's what I call it, that I tried near here when I went back to the scene of the sexual assault on the dirt path near the radio station tower. When I took the women that were at the dorm that day to the scene and one of the other men that were there, it helped jog their memory. They recognized the dirt path. They recognized the, the trees in that area and the, and the boulder and the slab of cement near where she fell down. They recognized it and it helped jog their memory a bit and more and different kind of information came out. One of the ways that we use cues in child maltreatment investigations to help kids remember stuff to tap into children's recognition memory involves the use of a prop. Can someone tell me what that prop is that we use in investigative interviews of children that helps them remember? A prop could be a wooden car, it could be a drawing on the wall, it could be a, a blade of grass. What do we sometimes use and take into the interview room with us when we're interviewing kids in child maltreatment cases? The dolls. The, dolls. the anatomical dolls. Uh, and when you, or if you take forensic interviewing of children, you'll see that there is a role for anatomical dolls. And one of the reasons why we use anatomical dolls is we realize that people, but especially children, need help remembering stuff sometimes. And the doll is simply a cue. Right? I said recognition memory is that amount of memory that we can retrieve or recall with the use of aids like prop, props. The doll is a prop. Or cues. The doll acts as a cue. A cue is something that triggers a recollection. A prop, if ever, ever any of you were in the theater in high school or college, it was a prop room, right? That's where you went. There were different things that um, helped put on the show. It also helps with the ambiguity because. Like little kids, not every little kid calls body parts the same thing, but will call a car the same thing because parents teach kids different things, so it can clarify what they need. You know what I mean? That's right, that's right. Very well put. Um, the dolls are used for clarification um, and uh, as a demonstration aid in forensic interviewing of children. They um, serve that primary purpose, and they also have the secondary purpose of helping kids uh, relate back to time and place. Um, and cue their recollections. So we talked about free recall and recognition memory last week. We talked about the fact that kids have more memories than they can communicate, that kids know more than they can tell. Um, we talked about script memory. Script memory is involved where there is m routine events that happen in a child's life or any person's life, where things are done regularly and strikingly similarly. They happen the same way every day, taking a shower, brushing your teeth, driving to school and parking every day in the same area of the parking lot. You know, those kind of memories uh, are difficult to tap into because uh, it's hard to differentiate one particular experience from another because it's done routinely or over and over again, showering, brushing your teeth, or just some ordinary examples. Sadly, in child maltreatment, some children are molested in their bed, in their home, uh, in nearly the same way, or in fact the same way, over and over again, sometimes for months and sometimes for years. You know, so if grandpa or dad or uh, the uncle comes in the room and uh, slides his hand down the child's pajamas and fumbles their vagina uh, the same way over and over again for a long, long time, you know, the child's not going to have a distinctive memory of any particular incident. And it would be unfair to the child, or anyone, but especially a child, to require that they remember any particular incident over any other. So what we try to do is ask them how it usually happened, or if it ever happened differently. You know, uh, Dad may have come in the room and, and, and fondled her under her pajama bottoms on her vagina over and over again for 
one or two years, but uh, one day it might have happened differently because uh, the cousins were sleeping over and they had to go in the attic. And something unusual happened in the attic. If there's some aspect of the molest that made it distinctive, then it's not part of script memory anymore. It has its own uh, set of uh, recollection that you may be able to tap into. Um, but um, if it is um, script memory, we would like to say to them, typically, is how did it usually happen? Recognizing that script memory is the kind of memory where a person doesn't remember any particular incident over any other one because they are all very, very similar. I did not talk about recovered or repressed memories, okay? And, you know, that's an area that's somewhat controversial. Sometimes women, mostly women, adult women, come to my office and I'm sure they come to child maltreatment, uh, although when they're adults, uh, it's unlikely they come to child maltreatment or DCPP, but they might come to the prosecutor's office or law enforcement and uh, be in their 20s or 30s or 40s and report a molest that happened when they were children or when they were teenagers. And sometimes they'll say, well, you know, I, I began going to therapy and, um, you know, uh, I... I I realized I was abused when I was in therapy. And it's sometimes referred to as a recovered memory. Um, very controversial, uh, not the kind of case where you could successfully prosecute in most cases um, because of it being controversial. And, and the fear is that somehow the therapist, in trying to explain their life's problems as adults, their fear of intimacy, their uh, horrible anxiety, their neuroses, or whatever it is, they kind of plant the seeds of that and help them formulate this memory. I mean, that's one of the aspects of it that make it controversial, that somehow it was the therapeutic relationship that created this memory rather than it ever being real. Um, but almost always, especially if they come to our office, um, you know, I, I ask them, uh, or one of our staff asked them, is this a memory that you completely forgot? Or are there parts of it you forgot and you may have remembered during therapy? That's normal and natural, and that's not a recovered memory. A recovered memory is someone who grows up, becomes an adult, and they got life problems. You know, they, they can't re interact well with members of the opposite sex, or they can't express their intimacy well, or they, you know, have severe anxiety, or whatever it is. And then the thought is, well, maybe you were abused as a kid. And then, you know, done properly, there's, there, there, there are those who are respected in the field of psychi psychiatry and psychology who believe that one could completely suppress, bury a recollection and have no independent memory of it as an adult. But it's there. And with the right kind of questioning, the right kind of reflection, they can recover that memory. So a recovered memory is a memory that at the moment that they go to the therapist's office, Right, or wherever they go, at, 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 throughout their adults, so they have no memory of being molested, but something triggered a memory that they never had. At least recently. They may have had it as it was happening shortly thereafter, um, but somehow it was buried away. Now that would be a recovered memory, but these women who come to our office, I, I say to them, was this truly a memory you didn't have that was buried away, or did you remember some of being molested, but you kept not wanting to think about it? And I've never had a recovered memory case. Nearly every adult who comes in their 30s or 40s or 20s or whatever that came in uh, and wants to prosecute or wants an investigation done, when I began or my staff began questioning them, they would say, no, I remember it, but not a lot. I try not to remember it. Well, that's not a recovered memory. Okay? You know, first of all, memory fades, right? People forget. Forgetting is part of, you know, the life cycle of a recollection. Right? So, um, someone who was molested as a child who's now in their 30s or 40s, they remember that dad would come up, but much of it is forgotten. Some of it's simply because of decay. Okay? Memory decays, or you forget, or it goes away. And some, perhaps, because they don't want to think about it. And they kind of push it in the corner. That ain't a recovered memory. 
that memory was never lost. It was there. It's just that they never thought about it recently, and they try not to think about it. And there's nothing wrong with through therapy or through preparation for court, remembering aspects of it through cues or props or whatever else helps them remember. So that's recovered or repressed memories. Stress and memory, we know that abuse is stressful. How stressful it is varies from person to person. There's controversy in our field, in the field of psychology and behavioral science, about the impact of stress. It's thought by some that stressful events encode the memory better. In other words, you remember a stressful event better. You know, if you were standing a 150 yards away from the explosion at the Boston Marathon last week, you know, that would be a very stressful event. And there's some research that said those kind of events are seared into our recollection. They're burned in there. They're remembered better. And there's, there's unfortunately, though, on the other side of that, there's, there's an equal amount of research that suggests that stress degrades memory. It, 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 it disrupts or interferes with the ability to remember accurately things that occurred. So, the jury continues to be out on the impact of stress and memory, okay? Some years ago, it was thought that stress completely degrades memory. It wasn't even um, suggested that it might make memory better. Uh, but more recently, there's research that suggests that stressful events uh, can enhance memory rather than degrade it. We talked about suggestibility last week, and suggestibility uh, is the potential for an interviewer to influence the recollection of the person they're interviewing, to suggest information or events to them that are not remembered. And almost always suggestibility, excuse me, is expressed in a negative way. So suggestibility is the potential for an interviewer to provide information to a child that misleads them or that um, puts information in the recollection that's untrue or didn't happen. And when we look at it broadly, it's the potential for an interviewer to mislead a child through the kinds of questions they ask or the behavior that they exhibit during an interview. Suggestibility is the potential for an interviewer to mislead a child and produce false or erroneous or mistaken memories based upon the questions the interviewer asks or the behavior they engage in. So one can be suggestive to a child based upon questions that are leading. Grandpa put his hand under your panties when he touched you on your coochie. Isn't that right? Well, if the child never made that statement before, that's a, that's a suggestive question. It gives the child all the information and simply requests that they agree or disagree. And it's suggested because the kid never said that in my hypothetical. Well, you don't have the whole interview. I just made it up. But assume that the child never said that. Grandpa put his hand under your panties when he touched you on your coochie that night in bed, didn't he? That would be a suggestive question. And sometimes our behavior might be suggestive. You might have the anatomical doll. You might say, when he touched you on your coochie, he used his hand, and if someone put it in their own pants or put it in the doll's pants, by showing or demonstrating the hand going under the panties, that might be suggested. One of the things that we look at when we size up the reliability of children's statements is whether they use age-appropriate language or age-inappropriate language. If they, you know, we would hope that they, or we think, or we expect that they call the private part the privates, or the wiener, or the pee-pee, or the coochie, or a, 
you know, a word that children typically use. We're a little startled when they come in and call it dick or cock or something else like that. We wonder where they got that word from, and we simply don't say, well, that kid must be lying or coached. Uh, when we teach interviewing, we say, well, that's, that's, a, that's a word that grown-ups usually use when referring to a boy's private parts. Where did you hear that word? Or where did you learn that word? Or tell me about that word. Um, it simply requires further review. But we're suspect when they use words that are age inappropriate. The other thing we look at among many, and we talked about all the kinds of things a few classes ago in, in assessing reliability, and those of you who are friends and interviewing, you, you do a reliability assessment in your last learning project. You watch a video and do a reliability assessment. One of the many things that we look at is whether they use sexually idiosyncratic language. Then he told me he wanted me to go down on him. Now, where would a kid hear that? Or then um, he got a towel and cleaned himself up. You know, what was the last thing that happened, Danielle? Well, his wiener got big, and then milk, milk came out, or milky stuff came out, or sticky stuff, or sticky stuff got on my hand, and he made me go get him a towel. And usually when it ended, it was sticky stuff, if we had a case with all those kind of statements, you'd be like, wow, you know, that's a good case. That's a good disclosure. That disclosure or statement by the child is reliable, because how would she know about ejaculation, the nature of it, you know? Um, its quality, that it's sticky, that it comes out at the end. That's idiosyncratic detail, right? Um, I don't talk about dolls here, but some of the, some of the um, videos that we use to teach dolls, the boy is demonstrating how he had to fillet another boy, and a girl's demonstrating on another video how she had to fillet her older brother, and, you know, she manipulates the dolls, you know, uh, uh, he's standing up and he pushes her down on her knees and while she's filleting him she takes the one doll's hand and puts it behind the other doll's head and makes the doll manipulate the head uh, her head but is showing what he was doing on her head during the act of fellatio or the oral sex on the man that's an oddball detail that we know is relevant or connected to human sexuality that happens in real life but a kid who you know, a kid who's not been exposed to you in sexual... An eight-year-old girl wouldn't know that boys or men or women or people do that. They might guide the head of the person who's performing oral sex on another. That's an oddball sexual detail. Simply getting on the knees to perform the act. Right? That's, a, that's, a, that's a, an aspect of human sexuality that's peculiar to it. Peculiar human sexuality that a kid typically, typically wouldn't know. So words like go down on or showing the hand behind the head... Um, those kinds of things are things that kids typically wouldn't know. And we say, aha! Must have happened. How else would you know that? Chris Freed, my colleague, tried a case once where a little girl had to fillet her uncle or father, I forget who, an adult male. And the interviewer said, well, how did it feel when he put his wiener in your mouth? And she said, hairy. Now that was the sensory recollection she had. And that was powerful. We were like, yeah, that, that, that's, that's a good... We're going to court with this one. Because, uh, you know, especially in, uh, years ago, but even today, the, the male uh, has pubic hair. And, you know, the hair probably went up against her cheek. And she felt that was her recollection of the sensory detail. And hairy. So we're like, yeah, that's good stuff. Now, suggestibility can happen from, this is all about suggestibility in part, it can happen from our words, it can happen from our behavior, it can happen from the props we use. That statement by that little girl in Chris Reed's case would not have been that powerful if we introduced anatomical diagrams of adult males before she made that statement. What makes me say that? We're like, yeah, she said, hairy, man. How would she know that? She's only eight. That's great. Men have pubic hair. She felt the hair in her face. We're going to yell at the jury and tell them that's a good case. This kid's telling the truth. The defense lawyer is going to come along and go, aha, this is not the smoking gun the prosecution says. So if we showed anatomical diagrams before she made that assertion, what could the defense argue? Because they were hair on the I didn't say dolls, but the, maybe I slipped and said dolls just now, but diagrams, anatomical. The picture had pubic hair on it, too. Mm -hmm. 
if the pitcher had pubic hair on it, it's not that big a deal, right? Because the kids could have drafted from seeing that. Okay, now we should look at that and remember to say that. I mean, we still got a half of argument here, but it's not as good as if we weren't being suggested. We suggested simply by showing her the diagrams is suggested. It suggests and communicates to the child that adult men have pubic hair around their penises. If the assumption going in is that eight-year-old girls don't know that, right? We showed it to her. <laughs> and then later on in the interview, interview we go, what, did, what was it like when he put his wiener in your mouth? She says, Harry, it's, it, it's not as compelling as if she wasn't suggested to through the diagram. You see how the diagram is suggested? It, it suggests and communicates that adult men have pubic hair there. And that kind of suggestibility can affect the quality of the interview and its uh, persuasiveness in some cases, especially the case I just described. So language and behavior, props, anything can be suggestible to a child, not just the questions. Nevertheless, we're most worried about questions. That's where interviewers uh, mess up most, by being suggestive during questions. But it's not only questions we're worried about. In fact, in the Finding Words Corner House Protocol that we talk about in the child in, in the uh, forensic interview course, there's some research performed in part by Jason Dickinson, who teaches at this university, who I collaborated with on another project where we looked at kids who were molested and they video recorded it and examined how they felt. Well, Jason and Deborah Poole from I think from University of Florida, they studied kids who went through the Finding Words Corner House Protocol that I advocate, and they argue that the use of the diagrams during the interview process is suggestive in and of itself. Now, we don't use adult male diagrams with pubic hair on them, okay? I just threw that out there to make a point. The diagrams that we use are very neutral. They're naked boys and girls that are the same age as the child. Excuse me. But... Jason and Deb Poole argue, in part, that those diagrams sexualize the interview. They add a sexual component to it. So that later when we ask these beautiful open-ended questions, they're not quite so open-ended because we already primed them just a little bit to think in terms of nudity and human sexuality. I don't agree with that assessment, but that's what they argue. You know, they say that the simple appearance of the diagrams can help us understand what they call the body parts is suggestive. It suggests and communicates something to the child. You know, and to the extent that it is, we, we have a purpose for using the diagrams early in the interview. Um, we we want to make sure that we are clear with the children, that we know what they call their body parts, that, that we can differentiate between the different body parts when we communicate with them about the molest scenario later on. And it really ignores the fact that 99% of our cases, the kid already made a disclosure. Their argument would be more persuasive if it was an institutional abuse case where some people disclosed and we were interviewing kids who never disclosed. Again, I think the, the, the risk is outweighed by the reward, and the reward is clarity uh, during the interview process. We understand what they call their body parts. We understand uh, that they understand what they call their body parts and we can communicate intelligently in an informed way about their body parts. So you want to be careful about suggestibility. There's no simple relationship between age and suggestibility. There's no simple relationship between age and suggestibility. And what we meant by that last week was just because an 8-year-old is 8 doesn't mean they're suggestible. Are they more suggestible than a 15-year-old? Yes. But there's a lot of factors. Some 8-year-olds are less suggestible than some 15-year-olds. There's variability across ages. So there's more to it than age. There's the repetition of questions. There's the relationship between the interviewer and the interviewee. There's the clothes that the interviewer wears, the language that they use. You know, so suggestibility arises not simply uh, because of age. It's one factor among many. No simple relationship between age and suggestibility. Suggestibility is multiply determined. A lot of things, as I just said, result in suggestibility. I also indicated to you that 
once kids reach about 10 or 11 years old, they're no more suggestible than adults. Adults are suggestible. Everyone in this room is suggestible. But around 10 or 11 years old, kids are no more suggestible than adults. So they don't have special vulnerabilities or um, we don't have to be super, super vigilant once they hit 10 or 11. Um, we should always be vigilant, but we don't have uh, fragile recollections here that are prone to being misled. Um, and the most suggestible at all, of all are the preschoolers, the little ones, as you might expect. We also talked about the fact that kids are more suggestible about peripheral details. Was the light on or off? Was it day or night? Was he wearing long or short pants? Those are the peripheral details or the less important details. Kids are more suggestible at those things with those kinds of issues. They're more likely to let the adult fill in the blanks. Well, the, the door was shut. Is that right, Danielle? That would be a leading question. And the kid, in many cases, would say yes to that. That's a detail that's not that critical, not that important, maybe important to the legal system, but she doesn't view it as important, and it wasn't central to her experience of being molested. Those things they're less suggestible about. I don't care how old you are. Okay? The fact that the body part was put on her body part, the fact that there may have been some pain or discomfort associated with it, the fact that he pushed her head down on the pillow, those kinds of things that are central to what was happening, really important, a big part of the molest, and the child's experience, they're less suggestible about that. Well, isn't it a fact that, no, didn't he use his elbow to push her out of the pillow? No, I said he pushed it with his hand. You know, that was a leading question, but the kid's more likely to be resistant to that because that's remembered best, and they're less suggestible about that because that was a central aspect. Whether the light was on or off, whether somebody had longer short pants, those kinds of things kids are more suggestible about. They're more suggestible about the peripheral details than they are about the central details. One of the other things that's problematic, and we study this at length in the forensic interviewing class, is stereotyping the perpetrator. And I mentioned it quickly last week. Anything that, when we're interviewing a child, anytime we talk negatively about the perpetrator, Anytime we talk negatively about the abuser, whether it's physical abuse or sexual abuse, research has suggested that they're more likely to give you a negative response or more likely to say bad things about that person than if you were completely neutral. If you demonize the perpetrator, if during the interviewer, <clears throat> interview you stereotype the perpetrator, the child is more likely to give you responses to the questions that are consistent with that stereotype. And you'll study that in forensic interviewing, the Sam Stone study, where a guy is supposedly clumsy and oafish, he knocks things over, and, and he comes in a room, he doesn't do anything, he leaves the room, they do this experiment with preschoolers. He leaves the room, then they ask the preschoolers all these questions about Sam Stone, and they were questions about whether he was clumsy or not, whether he soiled this teddy bear, got it dirty, got some peanut butter or mud on it, or chocolate syrup, I think it was, and whether he ripped his book. And the kids were more likely to dine out, blame Sam Stone, because they were primed over many weeks of suggestive questions and suggestive statements that Sam Stone's a clumsy guy. So when some clumsy event happened, where nobody knew who did it, they were quick to point at Sam Stone, because he was stereotyped as clumsy. Well, in the Margaret Kelly Michaels case, the investigators and the child protection workers uh, time and again made statements like, we just want to make sure you're safe and that Kelly doesn't hurt any other children. Well, that's a noble sentiment. Right? That's a good thing. We do want to make sure kids are safe and we do want to make sure that if Miss Kelly's guilty, this is an investigative interview. We don't know whether she did it or not. And that sentence concludes and tells the child she did do it to other kids. You know, we just want to make sure you're safe and that Miss Kelly doesn't do this to other kids. Oh, Miss Kelly did these things, huh? Miss Kelly touched other kids, that dirty rascal. I'm going to tell this detective or child protection worker exactly what, what uh, happened to me. That seems like uh, it hurt me or be consistent with what they're asking me about Miss Kelly Michaels. Other ways that Kelly Michaels was demonized is 
We want to make sure she goes to jail. The police were saying things like this for a long time. She shouldn't hurt kids like that. People who touch children are bad. And Miss Kelly belongs in jail. Well, that's, that's saying negative things. That's demonizing. That's stereotyping Kelly Michaels. So we've, we've, we've gotten that out of the way, little ones. We've already declared her to be evil. Now I'm going to ask you questions whether she did bad things. <laughs> we started out, our whole preamble was here to tell you. Now I'm going to be overstating it dramatically, but that's, you know, so you understand. <clears throat> that's kind of what's happening here. We, we stereotype Kelly Michaels. We call her bad and evil, a herder of kids. And now we want to ask you. Maybe Kelly bumped into the kid one time, you know? I mean, which he did hurt me once. You know, they want to they, they be consistent with the um, uh, conclusion that Kelly's bad and evil and, and belongs in jail. Not a good way. So that's stereotyping, stereotyping the accused. That is a form of suggestibility, right? So it's not only going in, then Grandpa put his finger in your butt, yes? That's a misleading question. That's a suggestive question. But suggestibility can arise in many forms, including what I just described to you, stereotyping the perpetrator. And children are most vulnerable to suggestion in ambiguous circumstances. We talked about that at the end of class, too. Give me an example of an ambiguous circumstance that we might be investigating child sexual abuse on. Bath time. Bath time. Give me another. Bath time is one. What's another one that sometimes could be? Diaper change. Diaper change. Very good. Is he diaper changing or is he following the vagina? Wrestling, horseplay, very <laughs> ambiguous. Is it subterfuge for cheap feels and molestation? Or is the guy really horseplaying or, or wrestling? Right? What else? Kissing. Kissing. It could be innocent kissing. It could be friendly kissing. It could be a kiss that cousins and uncles and fathers and mothers and caregivers <coughs> and people do. Or is it sexually? Medicine um, application. Medicine application. Very good. And why are we talking about these cases? Well, they're hard, and they require special, special kinds of skills when you interview a sexually abused child, a child who may have been sexually abused, in an ambiguous context. But the reason why they're relevant right now is because that's the kind of case, the kind of inquiry, where you could most easily or mislead a child. That's kind of a big one, too. Was he breathing heavy when he put his, the medicine on your coochie? Uh-huh, yeah. You know, we're looking for elements of the behavior that make this sexual. So if we offer them on a silver platter uh, sexual, sexual elements and they adopt them, uh, you know, then we may have turned an innocent thing into a sexual thing. Um, so in ambiguous situations, kids are very suggestible. It's a very dangerous in inquiry. I'm sorry, Suzanne. Bedtime. What did you say? When I used bedtime, to tucking in. I spike unit for kids five to nine. Mm -hmm. Bedtime was always being called in an issue because were they patting them on the back to calm them down from the nightmare, or you know, were they patting them too long, or you know, how close are they sitting on the edge of the kid's bed? It's parenting. <coughs> and That's right. Long, you know. It's, and if you think of it this way, you, the bedtime at the psychiatric facility we're at, or any of the other situations that I described and you offered as ambiguous, if you think of it, of it this way, caregivers are privileged to touch kids in a variety of ways. It's part of parenting, okay? We're supposed to change diapers, put medicine on, bathe kids, horse play, mess around with kids, put them to bed, hug them, kiss them jostle them, that's what parents do to kids, right? So, parents are privileged to touch children on their bodies, sometimes even their private parts, right? And what makes these so difficult is because this may not be what it seems like, that the parental privilege has been distorted, okay, and the child has been exploited for their sexual gratification. And there's a fine line between, you know, Parent, parental privilege and sexual molestation. 
So there's ways to investigate those cases, and I'm not going to teach you them here, but you're always looking about context. What time of day or night was it? What was the guy wearing? What was he saying? Um, you know, how did you feel? Did you tell him I felt uncomfortable? What did he say? You know, those kinds of things. And there's even more. Um, it's, a, it's a delicate um, task to interview children. I interview uh, children who may have been molested in an ambiguous context. And they are vulnerable to suggestion. Now, I told you that multiple interviews are okay. In fact, the best way to interview a child to get the most information and the best information is multiple interviews by the same highly trained interviewer. We don't have that luxury in child protection or law enforcement, and you can get more than enough quality information by doing a good interview from a single interview. And multiple interviews, if you were doing a bad interview, then multiple interviews compound the potential for problems and error. So multiple bad interviews can be bad. So one has to be careful um, when conducting multiple interviews. Now, uh, we wrapped up by talking about Margaret Kelly Michaels, and I mentioned it here. And you know, the lesson of Margaret Kelly Michaels is that in the state of New Jersey, and in some other states, but not many, the concern was that everybody was going to have to do this. In the criminal justice system, the Supreme Court of New Jersey said, if the defense lawyers can show that the interview of the child was suggestive, if there was some evidence of suggestibility, doesn't mean that the kid didn't remember what happened, it doesn't mean that the police or child protection didn't do a good job. All the defense has to show is some evidence, a little bit of evidence that they were suggested in some way. Pictures, dolls, <coughs> words, whatever. Questions. Then the prosecution has to show that the child's statements are a product of their experience and not a product of what the investigators or child retention workers suggested to them. Margaret Kelly Michaels gave us the legal doctrine of a taint hearing. And a taint hearing simply means that the prosecutor has to show that the child's memory came from experience in the event rather than suggestion. That's it. Taint here. The word taint means uh, somehow spoiled or marred or marked in a negative way. Tainted. You know, you ever grab a you know, quart of milk and you, you smell it and you're like, whoa, that milk's sour. Another way to think about it is the milk is tainted in some way. So the court gave us the taint here. There, the analogy is the, the memory is tainted. Now, how do prosecutors do that? Or if a deputy attorney general can have the same issue in the family court? Well, we look at the interview as a whole. We look at the nature of the questions. We look at whether they were leading or coercive. We look at whether they were open-ended, whether they tapped into free recall as much as they tapped into recognition memory, all the tools and all the things I've talked about the past two weeks. That's what we look at. And it's, it's especially... Um, helpful when we record the interviews, and then we can see the actual questions. And the other thing we look at in those kind of hearings is the, um, <coughs> the reliability factors, which we talked about. Are they consistent? Do they use age-appropriate language? Are they spontaneous? That list that we talked about. So it's not an insurmountable challenge if the judge says you I'm a little troubled here. I don't know if this kid remembers it because they remember it or because the investigator was a little too suggestive. I want one of those hearings. You know, Del Russo or Freed or Scuderi or Ms. Carlson, you're going to have to show me that this child's recollection um, is likely a result of him being molested or her being molested and not because the investigators ask highly suggestive questions. So what do you do? You show the video. You talk about who spoke to the child before the video started. 
uh, whether there was any potential to influence their memory there. We look at the video itself, the kinds of questions, open-ended, misleading, tag questions, blah, blah, blah. Is the child spontaneous? Is the child consistent? Does the child use words beyond their language? Do they describe ejaculation when they have no basis for understanding that? Do they talk about the hand behind the head or the penis felt hairy? You know, those are the kinds of things that we would argue to the court that make it um, likely that this kid experienced it and it wasn't delivered to the child on a silver platter by some untrained interviewer. That's a taint hearing. Any questions about that? Well, there you go, a 45-minute review of what we talked about last week. But that's good. I hope that you um, remember all this stuff well. And if you take forensic interviewing, it can only support what you do in that course. Um, well, we're going to move on now to the Learning Module 7, which is Chapter 6 in Professor Meyer's text. And this section's a little bit fun because it's very nuts and bolts. This, this section is, you know, very practical. It's, these are issues that arise in child maltreatment practice um, and in child protection all the time. That is the issue of confidentiality. Confidentiality. How do we handle confidentiality when it comes to children in the justice system? Do we treat, treat children any differently? What makes things confidential? Can things be confidential in one context, but not confidential in another context? When there is confidentiality, is it confidentiality for all time, or can somehow confidentiality be pierced or abrogated? Well, you know, all those things are important. All those things can happen. Let's start out with the basic issue here is what what is confidential? Well, confidential means something that is spoken or written, you know, as a secret, something that someone is not supposed to know, something that is secret and belongs to the parties to that discussion alone. Now, confidentiality can be defined broadly or narrowly, depending upon the reason for the confidentiality. Broadly, confidentiality can include any information about a client, no matter what the source is. Okay? When I say it can be thought about broadly or narrowly, if someone is in a psychiatric hospital and they're getting a particular kind of medication because they've been diagnosed with um, uh, bipolar disorder or some other kind of mental health illness, they have a diagnosis and they're getting a kind of medication, you would think, well, that's, that seems, if it's confidential, that's the kind of things that you think would be covered. And if only those kinds of things were covered, you would say that's a very narrow interpretation of confidentiality. But sometimes if you were to call the psychiatric hospital, now you work in a psychiatric facility, um, I'm sure when people call this is this Joe Del Russo patient there, the answer was no, that's confidential. That would be a broad interpretation of confidentiality. Not only is my private diagnosis and the medicine I'm on and, the, and my personal thoughts about life and, and the, whatever trauma I may have experienced, not only is that covered, but the mere fact that I went there or am staying there can be considered confidential. In some places, it wouldn't be. If that information is routinely given out by the hospital, then you would say that that would be a, a very narrow view on confidentiality, that they only consider confidential those things that are part of the discussion and the diagnosis and treatment. On the other hand, if the facility won't even confirm whether someone's a patient there, well, then that would be, that would be a situation where confidentiality is broadly defined. So depending upon the facility and the nature of the communication and the nature of the issues involved, confidentiality can either be broadly defined or narrowly defined. We tend to look at it broadly, and I will, you know, I will focus on its broad interpretation.
Before we do that, let's take a look at confidentiality here in a couple of law and order clips. I hope they play. We'll see. Whoops. What did I do here? We don't need any updates. See if you can identify how many confidential bits of information this person provides to the police, who have no superior right than anybody else to get confidential information at this point. Let's see if it even plays. Oh, good. we got a commercial. I wanted to make a place where kids could be kids. But I didn't just do it for the kids. I did it for you, moms and dads. I wanted a place where you could bring your kids and relax. Go to late and let go. Because they're going to grow up. Just not today. Not if I can help Check out our new food and fun value deal starting in 1999. Moore, was that a recall? You tell us. I don't see anything for a David Moore. Can I see that charge again? $112, no copay. Here we go, $112 for Joan Moore. First time prescription for Selegeline. What's that for? Depression, among other things. You'd have to ask her doctor, Dr. Richard Shipman. Right around the corner, 93rd. Okay. First of all, you know, that's the first time I ever noticed this. Let's take a, I don't know, hopefully I don't have to watch the commercial again. But I think, the, the, first of all, all they have the police is a receipt from um, the CVS or wherever they are. Probably Dwayne Reed in New York. And now I'm looking at it, I think it's even a different patient. I think yeah, yeah, Joanna yeah. Moore, they say Mr. Moore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she found a Joanna Moore. You know, I found the first Chuck E. Cheese. I wanted to make a place for kids to be kids. Yeah, I, I think, I think I it's about a man more, and then she yeah. finds a different yeah. more, Joanna yeah. Moore. Yeah. So it's right down to the in already, how many pieces of confidential information? Just not today. That she gives out that she shouldn't have. More was that a recall? You tell us. I don't see anything for David Moore. Can I see that charge again? One hundred and twelve dollars, no copay. Here we go. One hundred and twelve dollars for Joan Moore. First time prescription for Selegeline. What's that for? Depression, among other things. You'd have to ask her doctor, Dr. Richard Shipman. Right around the corner, 93rd. So what you got? Give me one thing. The diagnosis. The diagnosis or what mental health issues she may have? The name of the person. Who her physician is, where the office is. That she has insurance, insurance no that there's no copay involved. First time prescription. That, that how many times she's been there. The first time tells us that this may have been her first time. If it's suggested that it was more than one time, to an extent and duration. Office. Yeah, well, I don't know how confidential that would be, but. It, well, narrowing it down to a new, to which doctor? Um, and it's not even her diagnosis, though. This is what's even more problematic. She's just throwing it out, uh, you know. Among other things. Maybe it isn't for that. Maybe she's got it for something less, you know, serious. But even then, she's talking openly at the counter. They have exactly. You know, they specifically move to the side. They ask questions and everything like that. It's not open. Well, they go to the doctor. They go around the corner, the police officers, <laughs> as they should. They're doing an investigation. This is important information. So they go. They're good cops. <laughs> You know, hey, with the Chuck E. Cheese. I wanted to make a place for kids to be kids. But I didn't just do it for the kids. I did it for you, moms and dads. There ought to be a correlation between how long the video clip is and how long the commercial is. They're going to grow up just 
Something like this, they should just use a lower third, like a little banner. Is that why there's two hours of yeah, time on every DVD on that? Yeah, right. 1999. You can't tell us why you might have prescribed selegiline for her? I'm not even going to confirm whether or not she's a patient. I wish I could. I'm sorry, Dr. Patient Privilege. Well, her privileges have been suspended, Doc. She's lying in a coma at Stein Memorial. What? How did that happen? Well, so she is a patient. She got an insulin overdose from an injection. Oh my God. This drug you were giving her, was it for depression? But that's it. We found I had a patient who needed me. Don't forget about the one in a coma. This is going very well. Okay. So there you go. I call that confidentiality ignored, and then confidentiality respected right there. The doctor did what he was supposed to do, and the pharmacist uh, was a little off, off base there, right? So, you know, we could call things confidential, and we say, oh, the, the pharmacist broke the rules, and the doctor didn't break the rules. But what rules? Where do these rules come from? What makes something confidential? Well, Professor Myers tells us there's three sources of confidentiality. Just because something feels like it ought to be private doesn't make it so. It has to arise from one of these three bases of confidentiality. Okay? Three sources of confidentiality. The first is the ethical duty to respect confidentiality. The ethical duty. Now, an ethical duty arises from the procedures and practices of a particular professional discipline. Okay? The hot dog man in front of Montclair State does not have an ethical duty to protect any confidential information, even if some person confides in him. He doesn't have an ethical duty to protect any information, even if it's the most private information. Because the hot dog man is not licensed, nor is he part of a particular association or group that imposes ethical duties for membership in that group. Now, the video clips we saw there, the physician, the second clip we looked at, right, is a licensed person in the state of New Jersey. He's licensed in in the state of New Jersey and is monitored by the Board of Medical Examiners. All right? He's also probably a member of the American Medical Association, the AMA. In order to be a member of the AMA, there are certain standards that you must uphold. And if you violate those standards, you could be kicked out of the American Medical Association. And if you knowingly violate those standards, you can have um, your license suspended, or you can be expelled from the profession, depending upon the nature of what you did. Now, that's not about the law, and that's not about the courts. Those are different kinds of confidentiality. Excuse me. There was a time, and it may still be the case, where substance abuse counselors was a very prominent, I'll call it professional discipline. But it had no meaning in the law, it had no meaning in psychology, it had no meaning uh, in the social sciences, there was no groups, there was, it was just something that people participated in, and there were persons who became substance abuse counselors because they might have been former addicts, or they, they learned what the issues were in addiction and try to help others get better, get sober, get clean. But they weren't recognized by the courts, they weren't recognized by the law, and, and unless they were recognized by some private uh, professional group that they were a part of, there was not even an ethical duty to 
maintain confidentiality. Now, the profession of nursing, the profession of social work, both, and these are just examples, have professional organizations. There's the National Association of Social Workers. The nurses have a group, and I forget what they're called. Um, I think Myers talks about it in, in, in his book, the American Nurses Association. The ANA has rules and regulations for persons who are members of their group. And if you violate them, you can be kicked out of the American Nurses Association. If you violate the rules and regulations of the National Association of Social Workers, the NASW, you can be kicked out of that national organization. And among the rules of the nurses and the social workers and the doctors and others, these are private organizations. Among the rules are that you are to respect the confidentiality of your clients or patients. Right? Now, if the law doesn't give a damn about the nurses or the social workers, and if the courts don't really care whether they violate confidentiality or not, all you've got is that professional group. So you might say, well, that's not so bad if you screw up or you purposely, for whatever reason, do that. All they do is kick you out of that nurses' association or the National Association of Social Workers. Well, maybe you need that social workers' membership to get jobs or to be put on faculty or to, uh, to get particular trainings, you know? So even though it's a private organization, membership in some of these professional organizations can be critical for your ability to make money. So that is the least problematic for the professional if your professional organization violates you in some way, if you breach confidentiality. It's never good, but at least those are private organizations that you, you may be able to get by getting kicked out of them. If you violate the laws on confidentiality, and of course you may, you may be prosecuted if there are punitive aspects to the statute, you may be sued. For money damages, certainly, um, those kinds of breaches of confidentiality raise big issues. So we learned that the professional association that you belong to might have rules of confidentiality. The second source of confidentiality are statutes, laws. Some of you DCP and P workers. If somebody calls you up and says, hey, I want to, I'm from the Parker Record, and I want a copy of the file on Karen Stewart. We're talking about the homicide case from a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the father was on News 12 saying that the, the, the diapers messed up and they didn't investigate the case well. I want the records. I'm from the Burger Record. You would say, I'm sorry, those records are confidential. <clears throat> well, they just didn't fall from the sky confidential. They're made confidential by a statute. In Title IX, it says, Dyfus records are confidential. So that's another source of confidentiality. The professional, um, the professional rules of a organization, the ethical duties and ethical rules of a professional organization are a source of confidentiality. Number two source of confidentiality are laws and statutes that make something confidential. HIPAA is a big example, the Health Insurance Portability Act. HIPAA, that's a statute. HIPAA this, HIPAA that, right? Came the buzzword of 2006. HIPAA, HIPAA, HIPAA. You go into your doctor's office now, file this HIPAA form, fill out this HIPAA form. What's HIPAA? HIPAA is a federal statute. It's a law that makes our medical history confidential. It's a statute passed by the Congress of the United States. The day before it passed, it wasn't confidential. Actually, it was, but assuming there were no predecessors. The day before HIPAA was passed, this pile of stuff wasn't confidential. The day after Congress passed it, all this stuff is confidential. So ethical duties can arise from professional organization membership, or the legislature can pass laws or statutes that make stuff confidential. DIFUS records, health insurance, um, information are two examples of statutory <coughs> confidentiality. The last kind of confidentiality 
or the last source for confidentiality, the third one, are evidentiary privileges. E like Edward, V like Victor, I-D-E-N-T-I-A-R-Y. Evidentiary privileges. Evidentiary privileges only apply in legal proceedings. They got nothing to do with ethical duties, nothing to do with statutes. Evidentiary privileges apply in legal proceedings. In courtrooms and depositions and those kinds of things. Those kinds of confidential information are governed by the Book of Rules for Courtroom Proceedings. The Rules of Evidence. That's why they're called Evidentiary Privileges. Spousal Privilege. Doctor-Patient doctor Privilege. Attorney-Client Privilege. You may have heard these things in the popular media or throughout your careers. Those privileges come from the book of evidence that we use in the courts in all 50 states or in the federal jurisdiction where they have their own federal book of evidence. <clears throat> if it ain't in that book of evidence, it ain't a privilege. You know, I am a substance abuse counselor for 50 years. I belong to the Substance Abuse Counselors Association of America. I have 1,000 hours of substance abuse counselor training. Substance abuse counselors are recognized in 36 states. If it ain't in the book of evidence, it ain't confidential. So whatever you know from your client, you've got to say it in this legal proceeding. Because it ain't in the book of evidence. Now, you, you, you may not yell on Main Street, because you may get in trouble from your client, you may get in trouble by the Substance Abuse Counselors Association of America because you have an ethical duty to them. You may lose your membership with them as well. Even if there was a law that said the, the records of the Substance Abuse Counselor shall be kept confidential and any information shall not be shared with anyone, well, that would be a different issue, but if a judge orders the Substance Abuse Counselor to say it in the courtroom, they've got to say it. The only rules governing what goes on in a legal proceeding are those that arise from the book of evidence. So that's your third source of confidentiality. To recap, ethical duties that arise from membership of professional organizations. Number two, statutes or laws that make stuff confidential. HIPAA, DITIS records. Number three, evidentiary privileges. And the word privilege is an interesting one, and it makes sense when you think about it as I'm about to explain it. Where there is conflict in a democratic society that follows the rule of law, like we do in America and New Jersey, we go to a courtroom, and we try to resolve the conflict. We search for truth. We search for justice. Right? So, in that search for truth or justice, in our unique, not uniquely, in our way of resolving disputes in this country, the judicial system is entitled to every person's testimony. We'll talk about subpoenas in a minute, but in order to give justice, and we couldn't do it any other way, everybody, if you get a subpoena, has got to come and tell the story that's relevant to the case. Everyone. No man or woman is above having to come to court. Even the President of the United States sometimes has to testify. There's plenty of cases throughout the years where they have to give testimony. I tried a case about five, six years ago where a, pattern, a West Patterson police officer molested his daughters for many, many years. I prosecuted this uh, former police sergeant, and one of my witnesses was his former lawyer that raised privilege issues. Judge Raymond Redden came from the fourth floor went up to the fifth floor, and I subpoenaed him to be a witness in front of Judge Capicella because he had information that was relevant to my case. Just because he's a big shot and has a fancy car and parks in the privileged spot. 
in the county parking deck doesn't make him any more or less able to come to the courthouse and give testimony. And he did. The judicial system is entitled to every person's testimony. I don't care who you are. It's the only way to make it work to well, they don't have to get You know, you saw Henry Anne Boleyn was on trial. I'm not bringing them. It's offensive to the king to bring the witnesses against you here. People signed and swore to these documents. Well, they're on it. We're not bringing them here. It's offensive to the king. It's offensive to the king. It's offensive to me. You want to put me on a, a, a gallow and chop up my head. So everybody has to testify. Right? Once in a while, there's people who are, what's the word? Evidentiary what? There's some people who are privileged not to testify. That's where we get the word privilege. Wives are privileged not to testify against their husbands. Right? I just yelling and hollering that everybody's got to testify. The president, <laughs> Judge Redden. But sometimes witnesses have special privileges. They're privileged not to testify in certain cases based upon certain relationships. One I just alluded to, or specifically stated actually, was spousal privilege. Spousal privilege. The confidential communications between and amongst uh, spouses, among men, uh, husband and wife, are privileged in New Jersey and in the federal system. It used to be, but they changed this, it used to be that even if the wife wanted to testify against the husband, the husband can invoke privilege on her behalf and prevent her from coming in to testify. There was a case called Sidney Riso. If you have nothing to do, Google Sidney Riso. It was an Exxon executive who was kidnapped and I think murdered. I think it was Irving and Marilyn Flax murdered him, kidnapped him. And I think Marilyn wanted to testify against Irving. And Irving said, no way, privilege. And I am I'm invoking her privilege. And the public was outraged. How could this be? It was an open shut case if she testified. The federal government and the state of New Jersey changed the rules after that case. <laughs> you still got spousal privilege. If the wife doesn't want to testify, or the vice versa, the husband doesn't want to testify against the wife, then they invoke spousal privilege and it is sacrosanct. They will not testify. But if the wife wants to testify, the husband can't prevent her from coming to court anymore. The privilege is personal to the testifying spouse. They make the call, not the other spouse. Now, why do we have confidentiality? There's always a motive, right? There's always a basis, a reason why we make things confidential. Why do we care about confidentiality when a person goes to a psychologist? Why do we give a damn whether that information is shared with others or not shared with others? You think it's a good idea to get rid of confidentiality if you go to a psychologist? No. <coughs> what does the psychologist rely upon in order to diagnose you and treat you and help you? You find your relationship in your information? For you to be honest your information. The free expression of ideas and information, how you feel about stuff, right? It's critical to success in therapy, right? If you hold stuff back, it's very hard for the person to treat you. If you're afraid that, uh, you know, this is going to get out to your friends and neighbors, you're not going to be as open. And if you're not that open, it's hard to get treatment. It's hard to understand for the psychologist or the therapist, the clinician, to understand what, what the issues are. You need to be completely open and honest with the clinician, with the therapist, with the psychologist. And the patient needs to be able to share their facts, I mean, their, uh, their dreams, their fantasies, how they feel um, with impunity, without worrying about other parties, other people finding out about it. Okay? Same thing with an attorney and a client, right? If an attorney is going to defend the client to the best of her ability, 
Well, she needs to, she needs all the facts. How can you defend someone accused of a crime if the person is withholding certain aspects of information because they're afraid you might share it with someone else? We're talking about liberty here. We're talking about somebody going to prison. And in some states, in the federal jurisdiction, maybe even being executed. So when you go to your attorney, you know, you want to feel that you can say whatever you want. They can't share it with anybody. Who knows? You, you might withhold something that could have gotten you less of a sentence or proved your innocence. So these are special relationships. And these special relationships require the free exchange of information without fear that it's going to be shared with a third party. Nearly, not nearly, all confidential relationships okay, arise out of a more important public concern. Okay, there's public policy behind these things. And the policy is we find it more important to treat people and to encourage them to be free and open so they can get medical care or legal representation or whatever else it is. Uh, we find that to be more important than, you know, putting somebody in jail. Not always, but most of the time. Spousal privilege. Well, you know, we're, we're a society that values marriage. Marriage is important to society. Now, this is a hot issue now with gay marriage and the Supreme Court looking at it and what the boundaries are of marriage, what does marriage exactly mean. But throughout the years, uh, American society valued marriage in part because it was recognized as being important that two people commit to one another and procreation is part of the analysis that they would have children and society goes on and, and it's important that spouses can be intimate with one another, share things with one another, and not worry that they're going to be compelled by the government to, to tell their private thoughts to third parties. Um, marriage was so important, and this is not only America, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and England, and Ireland, and, and throughout the societies that rely upon uh, the English form of justice, um, there's a spousal privilege. Doctor patient is a legal privilege. Psychologist, licensed psychologist privilege in New Jersey. Doesn't have to talk about what his clients or patients say. There is, these, are, these are examples of privilege. News person's privilege in New Jersey. Not every state, but many have a news person's privilege. So if you pull up the Bergen record and give them information and the government tries to force that reporter to divulge your name or to divulge all of the information you gave the reporter, the reporter can assert news person's privilege in the courtroom. One time I had a case where this guy, John Custon, molested these two girls when they were pre-teens through their teen years. He was a tennis coach up in Packenac Lake. And he went to, uh, he came to our office, and we interviewed him, and he didn't make a statement. And we charged him, and we prosecuted him. But the next day I pick up the Burgum record, and I read in quotes, this was an anonymous source, Fred Kunkel, Fred Kunkel was the Burner Record reporter in the 90s. He interviewed, he called up Custom from the, from the phone book. And I look in the paper and he says, I should have stayed away from those girls. They were very wild. I should have never kissed them. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? I get Fred Kunkel on the phone. He confirms that he said that. I said, Kunkel, I'm subpoenaing you. Kunkel's... The Bourbon Record said lawyers, news person's privilege. Now, I was aware of a news person's privilege, but I didn't pick up the statute book and read it. I thought it was to protect anonymous sources. And I said, you mean when a guy goes on the record, we're not violating the privilege. He told the whole world this. It was in the newspaper. I just wanted, I just wanted to report it or repeat what was in the newspaper. To me, when a, when a person gives information to a newspaper or any media outlet for attribution. Attribution means you can use my name. 
I said it. I stand by what I said. Why should there be a privilege? <laughs> There's a rule that says, and I probably could have relied upon this, when you expose the information to third parties, I probably should have litigated it now and figured it out loud. <laughs> One of the ways that privilege falls to the wayside is, is if you communicate a private communication knowing there's a third party in the room, then the assumption is there's no confidentiality because there's a third party in the room, so you didn't intend upon the communication to be privileged. So you're a third party in the, the whole world was a third party in the John Custon case, now that I think about it. Anyway, you have a news person's privilege. It's another form of privilege where people do not have to testify in court because they're privileged based upon a public policy that's been identified. You know, the First Amendment, newspapers are important. Uh, we care that people can, you know, make phone calls and report um, things to newspapers. They are a check on governmental overreach, right? So we have a privilege there uh, where someone can report, report information to the newspapers and the news report. The news reporter cannot be compelled to testify. Now, sometimes those privileges are overridden. You may remember the Valerie Plume case. There was a case where a woman was a CIA operative, and it is critical if you're a spy that no one know you're a spy. And somebody told the newspaper, Washington Post, I think it was, maybe it was Bob Novak, I think, that Valerie Plume was a spy for the CIA. Now, she's an operative. You know, in, in, somewhere in, the, in Arabia or something, running around down there, and now it's in a newspaper, she's a spy. She could be murdered, right? She's totally vulnerable now because they put it in the Washington Post. In that case, there was a big issue about news person's privilege, about whether, you know, the guy has to reveal his sources or not. But sometimes there are special laws that require the sources to be revealed, because how can you run a spy agency if the newspaper can print who the spies are, you know? So it's not as simple as that, but recognize that there are there obviously there can be exceptions to these privileges, and that was an interest that was an interesting one. Aren't there exceptions if they state that they're going to commit another crime or something? Or is that something? Yes, you're supposed to read that. That's breaking confidentiality. The last one there, Tarasov and the duty to warn. So you need to read that case between now and next week. It's called Tarasov versus the Board of Regents of the of the University of California. State versus Snell is another one that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but um, spousal privilege, there's something called social worker privilege. Okay, but let's see what social worker privilege is. Who's covered? What do you have to do to get this privilege? And say, I'm privileged, I don't have to give testimony. Well, you have to be a social worker who's licensed or certified pursuant to the provisions of this act. And I don't have that section, but there's some rules about licensure. So you have to be a licensed social worker. And you shall not be required to disclose any confidential information that you got from a client or patient. Unless disclosure is required by other state law, or this is a Tarasoff exception right here. Clear and present danger to the safety of an individual. If you're involved in a lawsuit where the information is important, the patient's a defendant in a criminal proceeding. There's a waiver. So this is just an example of a privilege. It's an evidentiary privilege. It's the social worker privilege. What if you fall under both? What if somebody is like a licensed social worker or was, but wasn't practicing? Like there's the, um, like a situation where somebody in their past was licensed as a certain thing, left and became clergy. So you know what I mean? So then, it's, it's what you were at the time you received the information. Yeah, at the time you received the information. I mean, you may retire. It doesn't mean that the privilege didn't apply. Um, it, it, if you look at it, you, you, you acquire that information in the context of your professional capacity. You said something like that in the first one. So if that's how you got the info, then it would be covered. Um, here's an example of victim counselor privilege. Now, this victim counselor privilege was passed because... And it's a recent vintage. It's New Jersey Rule of Evidence 517. And the legislature realized in the 1990s that people who were raped or, or violently assaulted or the victim of armed robbery or carjacking or kidnapping, not all of them had um, 
the resources to hire a psychologist. Psychologists can be expensive. And there is a psychologist patient privilege. Some people just went to community-based mental health centers and just went to a victim counselor. And it created really a two-tier system of privilege. If you had wealth or a good insurance policy and you were a victim of a carjacking, you went to a psychologist who got paid and is licensed, and there's a clear psychologist privilege for 50 years. But if you were of modest means or poor, and you go to a mental health facility in your community, that person can be compelled to talk about your private feelings and whatever you said, because they're not licensed psychologists. So the legislature passed Rule 517, and that allows victim counselors to assert the privilege in court. That's the victim counselor privilege. And that's in your readings. And it's, there's certain rules here, okay? First of all, you have to be a victim of a crime. And it tells you what a victim of crime is here. Um, you have to be a victim of an act of violence here. Victims of violence need to openly discuss their emotional reactions to crime. Their reactions are often highly intertwined with their personal histories and psychological profile. And it goes on to explain why it is the public policy of this state to give a testimonial privilege to victim counselors. However, you have to be a victim of an act of violence. And it defines act of violence as the commission or attempt to commit any of the offenses in subsection B of section 11 if you go to that chapter, it'll have aggravated assault, sexual assault, robbery. So there's a list of certain acts of violence. So if somebody put a particularly disturbing piece of graffiti on the stop sign near your house, that ain't an act of violence. And if you go to the counselor because you can't sleep at night because the graffiti on the sign was disturbing to you, uh, you're not going to fit here because graffiti is not among the acts of violence. I didn't look it up for you. Trust me, it ain't there. <laughs> Confidential communication means, and then there's a definition of confidential communication, okay? And it doesn't say here, but I'm, I'm telling you, I don't have the whole statute here. The, perp, the reason that you're in that counseling is because you're the victim of a crime. If you are going to counseling because you've been through a particularly rough divorce and you confided in that counselor at the Clifton Mental Health Center, about your personal feelings involving the robbery a couple of months ago. It's been really tough to sleep now because that bastard cheated on me with the, you know, uh, uh, with the kindergarten teacher. You know, and then I got, I got carjacked about a month ago too. Oh my God, and I see the carjacker in my dreams. If the purpose of your therapy is for your divorce and you're receiving counseling for your divorce, um, it's likely that the statements made to a local counselor um, are not protected by Rule 517 because you need to be going to that person for the crime, um, the consequences of the crime on your psychological state. Now, next week we're going to talk about some uh, and we'll wrap this up and move on to the next section. But next week we're going to talk about some exceptions um, to all these privileges and all of this confidentiality. One exception arises out of, and we'll revisit this next week. Remember I said DIFUS records are confidential because Title IX makes it confidential. We can look it up, it's there. If we looked it up, there would be a paragraph that said DIFUS records are confidential. And then it'd be 13 new paragraphs that tell you when it's not confidential. <laughs> There's 13 exceptions. Uh, if you're doing scholarly research and you redact or get rid of the names or black out the names, if a court orders you to turn them over, if there are constitutional issues, there's, there's 13 or 12 or whatever exceptions. So with the legislature given, they can take it away. They make something confidential, they can make it unconfidential, or they can create exceptions to confidentiality. And the laws making DIFUS records confidential have a number of exceptions, which is not unusual. We looked at the social worker privilege a moment ago. There were a couple of exceptions right off the bat there. If it's a lawsuit, if it involves uh, uh, 
Some other issue I forgot. There were three or four exceptions right in the beginning of it. I talked about spousal privilege. There are two kinds of prosecutions in this country and in this state where even though a woman doesn't have to testify against her husband or a man doesn't have to testify against his wife, that privilege don't apply. Can you venture a guess? What kinds of criminal prosecutions do you think that privilege is out the door? Child abuse is one. There ain't no privilege in a child abuse case. Now, it's got to be abuse on their child or within that household. If, well, I don't know about that. I'm not thinking, if the woman's husband, if I'm a wife and my husband's accused of molesting the neighbor's kids, we have to look that up. You're always good at looking up stuff, Suzanne. Look that up for us. New Jersey law, spousal privilege, Child sexual abuse. And I'll look it up too. We'll look it up again. Go on to the Shiger Cafe. But there's an exception there. You can't, the wife can't rely on spousal privilege to not testify against her husband in a child abuse case out the window. But what's another even more obvious one? That in the 1990s, to this day, it's a scourge of society, these kinds of prosecutions. We have a whole unit dedicated to these kinds of prosecutions. Domestic violence. Domestic violence. You think, but. Yeah, but domestic violence, ah, the privilege. <laughs> can't testify against the batterer because of spousal privilege. But a husband can't testify against the husband. Uh, no privilege in domestic violence cases. Uh, but nearly everything else. Um, priest penitent, which they now call clerical privilege or spiritual privilege. I forget every state has a different characterization. But if you go to the uh, to your spiritual advisor, your priest, your rabbi, your imam, your your spiritual advisor, and you communicate with them in a confidential context, what you say to them may be privileged, and the priest cannot be hauled into court and forced to testify. Nor can it be waived. Interestingly, in that case, the privilege belongs to the priest and the penitent, and the person who goes to the priest. Most of the time, if it's attorney-client privilege, and if the client says, I don't care, I want my information out. I don't want to rely on the privilege. I want my attorney to testify. It's good for my case. The attorney has to testify. For some reason, in the priest, we call it priest, in the cleric, spiritual person, penitent privilege, person who goes there for spiritual advice, the priest can, can they, um, invoke the privilege or the penitent. And if the penitent waves, the priest can still say, I'm not testifying. News person is the same way, too. The news person can invoke the privilege. And so, and I think that's what hurt me with the third party. John Custon, the source can invoke the privilege or the reporter can invoke the privilege. Could it be kind of because between an attorney and a client, there's almost, it's almost like a contractual thing, even like the public defenders, you're still contracting with that one person, whereas the clergy, there's no contract. So eh, I don't think that's it, but I'll think about it. I don't, I don't think it's about the contract. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's more to that. I think perhaps, and I'm just thinking out loud like you, I think that it's important for spiritual advisors and for news persons to facilitate the privilege, to make sure the privilege is respected both ways. It's so important that people go to their spiritual advisor to get help. And any kind of publicity where that kind of information came out could undermine the profession itself. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just... I don't know what I'm talking about. Does it have to be like your... I mean, is there any... But it works both ways there. It doesn't work both ways with most of them. But does it have to be like your spiritual advisor? Because I actually have an advocate that came up with a case right now. They're just like, they told me because they thought it was kind of funny that the person is Muslim and is claiming that because she t 
talked about child rearing and her discipline practices with her friend rabbi. I'm listening, yeah. All of a sudden, she confided in someone clergy. The whole thing came up. And, but, and then, well, that's a very good the question. The idea, like, just in our side conversations, is like, but that's not her person. She's Muslim. It's not, but so it's, I don't think that matters. That, Here's the issue. If you look at the beginning out. of Meyer's book, if there has to be, you have to be in a confidential relationship and there has to be an expectation of confidentiality. And, you know, I'm a Catholic. If I'm feeling particularly vulnerable or down or messed up and I'm at a barbecue and somebody tells me that's a Muslim imam or whatever, I'm like, maybe I want to go over to him and get his, you know, get his feedback. And I, I, I hear you're an imam, I hear you're spiritual, I hear you're religious. And I run something by you. I'm really feeling vacant in my soul. Whatever you're talking spiritual stuff. I don't think it matters. I think what matters is is that you went to him. This is a person who who, who dispenses spiritual advice, and you went to him for spiritual advice. Um, I think that's what matters. Whether it's not your person or not, you know, maybe I converted at the barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that. Like, I can't convert. Going. Can I do by faith? Can I have two fakes? Okay, these exceptions are pretty interesting, and we'll talk more about them. So make sure you read Snell. Make sure you read Tyrosoft. It's a fascinating case. And um, the, the poor gal who was murdered um, in that case uh, was Tatiana. Such a beautiful name. Tatiana was murdered by this screwball out there who they had a couple of times... Uh, brought in uh, to the, um, uh, the University of Southern California, or was it UCLA? One of them. It was USC. They brought him into the university police a couple times, and he was, just, he was a little nutty, and they read him the riot act, and this and that, and they let him go. And then he, and then, then he went to his um, therapist, and he said he's going to kill Tatiana. And nobody warned anybody, and that's what the parents, after Tatiana was murdered, the, the issue was. The therapist should have warned us that this guy threatened to murder our daughter. That's not, well, confidentiality. Really. Truth. Confidentiality. Can confidentiality be overridden when there's a threat to a third party? That's what Tyrosoft is all about. It's a fascinating case. Um, and it's the kind of case that they read in psychology school, medical school, law school, um, and everywhere else. It's the, one of the most important cases in the in the. Um, um, world of psychology and medicine when it comes to confidentiality. So any questions about what we talked about? Good, 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 good. I'll see you next week and we'll talk about the exceptions to confidentiality and we'll start learning module 8 as well.